first moved to LA, mm -hmm. I was a production assistant on a bunch of movies, TV shows, like kind of rolling around doing my thing. I had a friend that was an editor. Well, he's a PA in the edit editorial department. Uh -huh. I didn't know what an editor did other than the obvious cutting, right? Then you go into TV, you go into live television. There's so many different levels. When, when I first met you mm -hmm. and Mimi, you know, my wife said, you know, you, you edit trailers. I was like, uh -huh. oh, okay. So he, what film is he on or what TV show is he on? And she's like, no, 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 he works at a trailer house. And I was like, what's a trailer house? So <laughs> kind of like blew my mind that there was like another level of, you know, artistry, you know, mm -hmm. of these people that come in after a crew of guys and girls or whatever, you know, edit the TV show down. Yeah. You all come in and edit the trailer. So like yeah. for someone like myself, the layman 15 years ago, um, could you explain like what exactly that that you know that that job and what mm -hmm. that entails for someone that doesn't understand why why isn't the person that's the editor editing the trailer since they just cut all the other footage down? Yeah, it's it's funny because because it's a it's a real special skill skill set. Um, you have long form, you have long form editors even in television or film, and they cut the movies, and then you have short form editors, and I'm what you would consider a short form editor. And uh, movie trailer editors are a very, very, very specific type of editing. If you watch a YouTube video versus a movie trailer, it is vastly different. In movie trailers, you're dealing with, you have to do a lot of things right. You have to tell a really good story. A lot of it is sound as well. So sound, sound effects, you know, there's this big explosion. <laughs> And then they say something really important, you know, okay. or, you know, there's the music and the music climaxes all the way up to a crescendo. And then, boom, it goes pitch black. And then uh, then a moment, you know, where the actor uh, has said something really important. So the, diff the difference is short form editors are trained to do that specific thing. And long form editors are trained to do their thing. Very, very rarely do they cross you know it's it's a very specialized thing and i didn't learn that until i was a runner and a production assistant for a company yeah you basically if i recall correctly you was it arsenio hall or something you were working on oh yeah you were kind of making deliveries and you started to get around these editorial houses okay so i'm gonna go all the way I'm gonna, go, i'll, I'll go or you can go back to louisiana wherever I'll, you know i'll go i'll go all the way back um <laughs> Yeah, how do you want to start? No, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you can tell, like, in, in, in terms of, like, I assume you came out here yeah. to L.A., like, without the idea that you wanted to be in editing. <laughs> no. Just, you just came out here and, like, hey, my parents are moving or whatever, you know. All right. And, and so I'll, st I'll, start, yeah. I'll, I'll start at the beginning. All right. Please. So, yeah. so, okay, so the very beginning is I was at college at LSU, and I was a freshman at LSU uh, in Louisiana, and I was watching the Arsenio Hall show. And me and my roommates, we watched it every single night. It was it was our it was our thing, you know, the dog pound ooh, ooh, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And at the time, it was the hot show. You know, it had all the great artists on it. It was probably it, it it was it was my way to relax. And at the time, I was a freshman. I was rushing. I wanted to get into a fraternity because that was the cool thing to mm -hmm. do in in the South. I didn't realize that being Asian <laughs> was a problem in a Southern, in a Southern fraternity system. Right. right. So I, I went and I rushed, you know, I, I graduated high school, like kind of a, sorry, this, this is going to sound fucking pompous, but can I, can I swear on here? Sure. Okay. I graduated high school and I, I was like the guy I had president student council, the prom king, the whole thing. And then I get into, I get to Baton Rouge. That's in Alexander, Louisiana. And I get into Baton Rouge and I, I can't get arrested. None of the fraternities would touch me. I rushed. Then the second year I was there, I rushed again and none of the fraternities would take me again. And I, a lot of my friends were in the fraternities at that point. And I asked them, I said, what, what's the problem? And they said, it's cause because you're Asian. That's I, literally what yeah, they, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, and some of them were even worse. Some of them were like, we're not letting chinks in our fraternity. Oh my gosh. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so at that point, I was like, so back to Arsenio Hall. I'm sitting there watching Arsenio Hall. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm getting out of here. My parents had moved to California uh, my sophomore year in college. And I was like, I'm going to go work at the Arsenio Hall show. And my roommates are like, what? What do you mean you're going to work at the Arsenio Hall show? And I'm like, no, I'm going to go work at the Arsenio Hall show. And, I, of course, I had no fucking clue. Mm -hmm. I had no clue how to do that. Yeah. But I came out in May of 1990 to California. My parents uh, had, were already living out here with my brother and sister were out here. And I tried to figure out how to do it. And um, I guess I should tell you how I did it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I do recall, you know, you were you were delivering tapes, you know, your first yeah. couple couple jobs. It was like your first job. Well, oh, so once it's funny because I, I got out here like a fish out of water. Louisiana at the time was super conservative, ultra conservative. And me being in that sort of in that in that world, I was dressing ultra conservative. I I walked up to Paramount Studios. Picture this white bucks. Red and white seersucker pants, white shirt, and a bow tie. <laughs> a bow tie. That's okay. Awesome. I walk around 5555 five, five, five Melrose. Yeah. I'll, I know the address yeah. because I, I worked there for so long. And I walk around and I go to the guard gate and I said, I want to work here. And the guy goes, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I said, I, I want a job. And he goes, well... He looked at me up and down, and then he saw I had my resume in my hand, and I had my bow tie oh, yeah, on. Yeah. And he's like, uh, well, maybe you can talk to Human Resources. And so I went into Human Resources, and they told me, um, well, one of, uh, one of the great entry-level jobs into entertainment is being a page. Yeah. And so um, I ended up uh, applying and getting a job as a page. And for – those of you who don't know. That is a big thing for yeah. whoever's listening. Yeah. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, a page is a really great way to get break into the entertainment industry. It allows you uh, – so what you do is you basically – you wear this really bad suit and you seat audience members for television shows. I got the job and I was like – you know, a lot of people – shit on pages and mm -hmm. they think it's a terrible job but yeah. i was like this is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life yeah so i would let in the audience for cheers yeah arsenio uh different world fresh prince of bel-air um i'm dating us uh, mad about you mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh those kind of shows and i was on top of the world because i was like I he i'm here i made it you know and i was getting a measly i think it was seven bucks an hour and i was mm -hmm. super happy yeah, super happy to get it. So, were you living with your parents at that time, or I was living with my parents at the time, and I was going to school at uh, at Glendale College. Okay, and UCC. That, yeah, and that's where I met. That's where I met my wife. Okay. Yeah. So then, when when you came out here, your parents were already here. You went in. You said, "Okay, I want to get this job." At least you were in the air conditioning, because I remember my first job being a PA. So oh yeah. Is, you know, you're outside a lot. You, yeah. Depending where you're at, and yeah. Or you're sitting in your car, which has air conditioning, but it's you know, it, it, it's it's not the same experience as you know. You got to dress up, and it's it's a whole. I I know a couple people personally in New York too that were pages, mm -hmm. and they usually do turn out to have pretty solid career paths yeah. from there. You yeah, know, the people listening might be like, "What's a page?" and and obviously yeah. you, you broke that down, but it, it really is a bigger thing than like I think for PAs it was like. How do I get become a DGA trainee? Yeah. For yeah. like when I was in that world. Yeah. Was, that was the thing that people were like, oh, I got to go take the test. And I get in, can I get in? Can I get in? And that was the thing yeah. that we all wanted to get into as uh I tried to do that. Yeah. Oh, did I, you? I, I, I did not get hired. No, me neither. Me <laughs> I, neither. Did, I did not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard to break into the in entertainment industry if you, you don't, don't know anyone. If you don't know anyone. Yeah. I mean, I sat on my couch or no, my desk in Hollywood. I was just emailing resumes all day, yeah. all day, all day, yeah. all day. And then I told this story before, but, you know, I got a lot of deferred work. Yeah. If the film gets picked up, you'll get paid. But yeah. can you put in 12 weeks of work for free? And yeah. it's like all this crazy stuff. And you're like, uh, I don't know. So not knowing anyone is a huge disadvantage, especially yeah. for you coming from out of state like me. Yeah. Even LSU. I mean, even yeah. if you stay there, who knows? I mean, like a lot of people that get college degrees and then they go into production Oftentimes, in my experience, did you need it? I don't know. You yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So then, 
you, you you take this job and then and then what happens? What 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 pushes you to what what's the sort of like, oh, editing. I want to give that a shot. Okay, so so I took the job. I was working at Arsenio Hall a lot. That was the show that I worked at a ton. And, you know, it was the nineties were so R and B hip hop. Mm-hmm. That was such a big deal back then, and we'd see all these amazing artists. And, you know, one day I was uh, not supposed to work, but someone called in sick, and I ended up working the show. And they said, it's a mystery guest. I'm like, okay, whatever. And it was Prince. Oh, wow. It was Prince. And that was my growing up. Like, you can ask my mom. (laughs) Yeah. That was my thing. Yeah, Purple Rain was, like, my thing. Like, that movie was crazy. So it was fucking Prince. Yeah. And... He shows up, he's got a bus full of people, and it was all hands on deck. They had to hire, they had to bring in more pages because there were so many people. He took the whole hour. Mm -hmm. He performed like 10, 12 different songs. Mm -hmm. And it was probably one of the most memorable things of my entire life to see him up close. I mean, like me and you, you Mm -hmm. know, some, you know, it was a year and a half ago before that I was, I was in my dorm room watching Arsenio Hall. Telling people you were going to do it. Yeah, telling people I was yeah. going to do it. And I had no idea I was going to do it. And there I am sitting there, and, and Prince is in front of me. Yeah. You know, And I still have, they gave out these tambourines. I still have this tambourine that, That's awesome. that fr- from the show. And um, he performed. And first of all, I couldn't believe how small he was, number one. Mm-hmm. And, then I, and then when he was warming up, I couldn't believe how he played the guitar he played it as if it was part of his body it like it was part of him yeah. and yeah it's an experience i will never forget and then another show i worked was is another show where mc hammer was a big deal at the time with the pants okay with the pants and he he took the whole show and it was like uh it, it was amazing because he had at the time i was like you know prince showed up and he just had like one bus but mc hammer had three buses and i'm like what the how how I started to go. How is he going to pay all these people? <laughs> the, the racehorse. So my them. job was to make sure it was it was two bus loads of dancers. Wow. So two bus loads of dancers. There was stage twenty nine, which was Arsenio stage, and then tw- stage twenty eight. And stage twenty eight, we were um, we were there, and we were actually. Um, my job was to make sure that all the dancers got dressed in between songs and run back onto the stage. And so it was. It was chaos. It was. It was. It was fun, but it was. It was kind of nuts. Yeah, nuts. All right. So no. So, so how do I? How do I get into editing? Yeah. How I, well, where does that lead you from? In terms. So, yeah. so after that, I end up. I end up working for the Arsenio Hall show, and then I ended up that show went away, and I ended up working for a show called Mary Lou Henner Talk Show. Mm. Mary Lou Henner from Taxi. Yep. Um, I didn't know she had a show. I, I remember. Yeah, she, I remember the actress. So there. she had a talk show, and of course, you know, she'd bring on some of the people from Taxi. I think okay. I met, I met uh, Danny DeVito, Michael Douglas, a bunch of people. But you know, the show wasn't on very long, and then um, I was a production assistant there. Mm-hmm. I got a full time job. I was no longer a P. Uh, I was no longer a page. I was now a production assistant, so I had to like clean up her dressing room and park her car and get her lunch and all that sort of stuff. Okay. And then after that, that dissolved and uh one of the producers on there said, Hey, do you need a job? And I said, Yeah, I wanna I, I want a job a- on any show. And he goes, Well, a friend of mine owns a trailer house. And I'm like, what's that? And they said, um, well you you make movie trailers. I was like, all right, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I went, I did the interview. And I got the job, and I was a runner. I was delivering tapes to Disney and Fox, and that's at the time there were tapes. There's no longer tapes, but there were physical three quarter tapes. So, of the rough cuts they would do for the trailers, that was that's how they watched them. So you had to have a runner physically deliver it. You couldn't, folks. You couldn't email it. <laughs> like you can now. Yeah, drop you couldn't box. post it the yeah. way there was no World Wide yeah. Web yet. So you had to physically drop off tapes. That's how I got over to, into the editing sort of world, that was my first foyer into it. So you're going there, what, how many days a week, every day? Every day. I was working like 12, 12 hour days. Yeah, PAs are yeah, first you're, there, last to leave. Yeah, you're you're at everybody's beck and call, mm-hmm. whatever they say. And so I ended up working uh, for a company called New Wave Entertainment, and they were here in uh, Burbank. And what happened was the the editors were, were super nice to me, and I would... Uh, 
some of some of my job was to take their cars to get them cleaned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, one one day in particular, I went to a company. I had to deliver a tape to another trailer house called Aspect Ratio, which mm -hmm. was the trailer house in town. Okay. And I was walking through, and I saw a Range Rover, I saw a Porsche, I saw a BMW, I saw Audi, I saw like all the best cars, the right? And there was some poor scrub that was like me, washing those cars, and I said. I said, is somebody famous here? I asked him, he said, no, no, these are the editor's cars. And I was like, oh. <laughs> My bulb. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, man, how much money do these guys make? So I started to become more interested in editing because sure. of the money. Yeah. And at the time, um, I'd, so then I worked my way up, way up to an assistant editor. And once I was an assistant editor, as an assistant editor, I was getting sound effects for editors. I was getting their bays ready. I was... Uh, digitizing footage. I was bringing in footage into the console for them to edit with, and uh, getting making sure they were completely uh, sufficient. And one of the editors said, "Would do you want to be an editor?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Why not?" And I and I said, "I said I guess I could try." I mean, he's like, "Well, why don't you why don't you try the tutorial?" There's there was an avid tutorial. Oh, you, to you go right down, sit down, and yeah, just give it a shot. I, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I so the editors would go home at like seven or eight o'clock at night, and so as a PA, you can't, you're not even allowed not even, in their yeah, bay, not even close right? To, but yeah. this guy let me oh. go into his bay, so he said, just don't fuck up anything, right? And you can use my bay. So I went in at about eight o'clock at night, and I did that tutorial till the sun came up. Wow! And I was like, <laughs> oh, this is kind of fun. And I enjoyed it. And then so once I realized that I ended up I ended up staying after the editors would leave and trying to teach myself how to edit. Because not a lot of them were open to teaching me how to edit. I was gonna, you know, you, basically you don't want anybody taking your job. Sure. You know, it's and hard. Not, yeah, it's so not like you could go home and have Final Cut or something on yeah, your lap. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you can't edit on yeah, your phone. You had to be at Yeah, that you had bay. to be. You had to be in the edit bay. Yeah. I learned at night, and then I remember one of the one of the one of the owners of the company, a guy named Alan Haynes. He says he goes on the intercom and he says, "Listen, I need an assistant editor to cut a spot tonight." For those of you who don't know, a, a spot is a just short short commercial for a movie. Uh, this in in this particular case for a movie, and it was for uh, it's a movie called Waiting to Exhale. Mm, oh, okay, with yeah. Whitney Houston. That's right. And um, oh, you've been around Prince. Yeah. Right, <laughs> he said he said I need this spot cut tonight. And I was like, okay. And it was a radio spot. And I had only edited maybe like three weeks, right? So I stayed all the way. I, I, I went in at like 8 p.m. And I edited the best I could until 8 a.m. the next morning. And an editor came in and I still wasn't done. It was just it was just a thirty second radio spot. Radio spots mean you don't you don't need any video. It's not that hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're just putting together audio. But an editor named Amy Weber came in the next morning at eight a.m. and before the before everyone else came in, and she helped me. And she said, she said, let me help you. And she put together the spot for me. She finished it for me, and I presented it the next day to the owner, and he was like, great. And from that point on, I was considered an assistant editor that could edit, that could cut. Okay. So, thank you to Amy Weber. I still, I'm still in That's contact huge. with Amy. Yeah. She helped me um, basically become an editor. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, it was, I was like, okay, then you know, and then compounded with the fact that I saw how those, much cars. Money, yeah. those cars yeah. and how much money they made, I was like, well, shit, maybe this is a career. Maybe this is something I can do. Yeah. So yeah, I. I, I was like, I liked it, and the money was good. So you become the assistant, or an assistant. Uh, how many were there? How many assistants in the There episode? were, I think there were like 10 editors, and there were five assistants. So okay. each each assistant was an assistant to two editors. Mm, okay. My editors were uh, were a, uh, Barton Diffie and Van Harrell, and hmm. I, I'm still in touch with both those guys. I love That's them. That's crazy. love them both. They're great. Yeah, so like, so you, so you, so you continue working down there. Now, how many years are you putting in till, till maybe they say, okay, we're gonna have you do your own spots, or we're gonna have you get more involved than just the occasional car wash and, and, yeah. and editing and stuff. <laughs> you know, I've been there too, PA. You know, <laughs> like, why am I picking up 
espresso at yeah the, the, don't ask you know yeah yeah okay so what ended up happening was there was that one of the uh one of the owners i was uh one of the jobs as an assistant editor is you would put a slate on a tape which meant almost like a a little a little graphic that said the name of the spot the voiceover announcer and then the the title of the movie and kind of so like they, when you're doing the yeah acting. yeah so they know what yeah. they're watching well i misspelled a VO guy's name, Andy Geller. I misspelled the name. And I remember somebody saying, Who's, who, who sent this tape out and went on the intercom? Report to my office immediately. I went to the owner's, I went to the owner's office and um, he fucking threw the tape at my head. Wow. Yeah. And you remember him too, I guess. Still I do, I do remember him. I am not still in touch no. with him. Um, you know how to spell his name though? I know how to spell his name. I know how to spell the owner's name. Yeah. I I hesitate to say his name yeah, now yeah. because I don't I don't want to. I, I, You're still working. <laughs> yeah, but he was a dick. Yeah. God, what a dick. That's that's a lot in Hollywood. You'll yeah. meet you know yeah. from time to time. Yeah. Not, not everyone, but so that's when I decided. You know what? I'm gonna quit. Mm. Like I, done. Like that, no, that, I, that job. Wow. That job. Yeah. I was like, I'm not. I'm it's not worth it. I, I'm not gonna let you. The frat fraternity in Louisiana was better than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I quit. I quit my job. I had just proposed to my wife. Mm. So my wife was like, You're unemployed. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you just proposed. Yeah. You just quit. Can't do that. I had just emptied out my bank account. Oh, no. I spent, had spent, I had zero dollars. I spent $3,400 on her engagement ring and I had just proposed and I was jobless. Mm. <laughs> and, and I ended up, um, getting a job as an assistant editor at a company called Studio City in uh, in Los Angeles. I don't know okay. why it's called Studio City. It's not in Studio City, but... Like Beverly uh, Hills, whatever, but it's in like yeah. Calabasas. It was called Studio City. It was run by a guy named Stu Weiss, who uh, is one of my mentors and uh, taught me a lot about editing. He hired me at uh, $27,000 a year. I'll never forget the salary because yeah. he wrote it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> he would always do this thing where he writes it down on a piece of paper and just shoves it over. <laughs> and uh, and he said, I'll start you at this. And I went, okay, fine. So I started the very first day. I started the very first day. At a, and, uh, you know, I knew how to be an assistant. And he goes, oh, the phone rings. He's like, hey, by the way, um, we need a spot for this, for this movie for NBC. Uh, it's called Pandora's Clock. It stars Richard Dean Anderson. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's it's about a uh, it's about a plane that there's a virus and they can't let the plane land, you know, before a certain time. So anyway, it's uh it's one of those NBC movies of the week. He goes, "Can you cut a spot?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. I'll you know I'll try." He's gonna call Amy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call Amy. <laughs> so I ended up uh I ended up cutting the spot and they, it was it was this was no no longer a radio spot. This was a TV spot. And it was like a cast spot. He's like, you can do this. It's a cast spot. So a cast spot is like, all it is is, the, uh, you know, Pandora's Clock starring Richard Dean Anderson. Da 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 da. And it just you just all you have to do is show their face. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. can't be that hard. Yeah. I was In able theory, to do it. Yeah. What I didn't know was I don't think Stu had any. Um, what's the word? He he never anticipated using me as an assistant editor. He wanted me as an editor. Okay. Yeah. So. He got well, 20, at that salary, at a twenty-seven thousand yeah. dollar editor, yeah. Which, at the time, I don't know if you know what editors make, but that's that's very very low. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you got a bargain. Yeah. 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 So, listen, I was happy to do it. You yeah, know, I was I was yeah. brand new. You yeah. know, so I ended up I was working nights, and I ended up working nights as a night editor. So, is that for people listening? So, you you will have people working days, nights. In terms of, is that like a common thing even today? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well like for depends. someone listening, it's like, oh, editing sounds cool. Like, you know, is it just like nine every, to six? Right? Every company's different. Yeah. Okay. Every company's different. And I think it's always depends on the deadline. Got it. You know, if the deadline is tomorrow, yes, you're working all night. You know, But it's not like a, a, a usual, like, hey, you're the night person. You're the. the well, day some companies. So this particular company, Studio City, we had a, we had a day editor from, from nine to five and then from, the night shift started at five and mm. would go till two, three in the morning. Sure. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got the job. So you're 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 back here now, saying like, okay, I'm I'm an editor now. Yeah. At this salary. Yeah. Right. And then do they start handing you bigger and bigger projects as you're? Yeah. So after 
they were thrilled with my 10 second cast yeah. spot <laughs> which <laughs> which took no talent uh they start yeah they they started handing me more more and more sh- more and more things and you know there i had a really great creative director named peter walsh took me under his wing a little bit and taught me what he knew um and then i learned a lot from a guy named Stu weiss the owner of that company about music about sound effects about about writing copy so at that time i was what's called a predator and a predator is a producer editor and in that particular in, in in that particular job i would produce i would write the copy i would edit it i would do all the sound design and then we would send it to nbc and they would put it on the air so the creative process for someone listening right yeah can you break that down like, like sure. from music to sound effects to yeah. you know what's producing versus you know editing and predator, and predator you know yeah well so as you as you as you go up the ladder, let's say like let's say somebody who edited what's the biggest film out right now? Wonka, maybe. Wonka. Let's say you edited Wonka. <laughs> let's right? call it Wonka. So as you get into these sort of larger, big budget things, things become more and more specialized. So an editor in on Wonka, is only editing. He's literally all he's doing is putting the picture together and he's putting the the dialogue together. And then usually, a lot of times, you'll have someone else do the sound and you have someone else do the music and then you'll have you know someone else do sound design and then you know have like you know if Wonka's running through a field they'll have somebody in 80 yard adding the crunching to the sounds of the feet running through the field the the more far you are removed from those high profile projects the more the person has to do on their own so as a predator in my particular job there, we were doing the NBC movies of the week at the time, This uh, our company, Studio City. So what we had to do was we had to produce everything. Producing means, you know, basically structuring of, of, the, uh, of the spot. You have to edit all the picture together. You have to add sound design, sound effects, booms, whooshes, things that add, you know, anticipation and, 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 and drama to the, to, to the, uh, to the piece. And then you had to find your own music. So you had to do it all. A one-man band. <laughs> you had to, yeah, it's a one-man band. But the best thing about that is, is you know, and I'm jumping forward now, is everyone's a one-man band now. Oh, okay. So I learned how to do all of those things. I learned how to write. I learned how to produce. I learned how to edit. I learned how to pick music. I learned how to do sound design. And, you know, that was just such a great training ground at Studio City. Yeah. So you're able to pick up all these skills at that one. How many editors are at this place? This place had about eight editors. Okay, so yeah, uh, do you, and you, you. Well, became... I'm sorry, we had 16 editors. We had eight, eight, eight oh, then assistant, eight, eight bays, eight editors during the day and eight at night. Okay, yeah. and then, and then what I realized slowly was there were no assist- assistants. None, because <laughs> you're the one man band. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had to do everything. Got it. Well, that's good though because yeah. when you learn in that sort of atmosphere and kind of DIY, you know, in in the beginning. For someone to just learn one skill, what like you said, sound design or the leaves crunching or something, kind of puts you at a disadvantage, I think, mm-hmm. going forward if you want that trajectory in your career because now you can draw back to that in the future and say, hey, okay, I've done this because I understand producing. I understand. 100%. You, right? Yeah. I mean, and with AI, a lot mm. of those jobs are going away. Yeah. I bet. AI can do a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. You know, so, so there's all of that. Yeah. So then, okay, so you spend a couple years here and then- what is it? Your next step from there? Is it- so after that, I was so that was that was editing TV promos. So mm-hmm. I was editing promos for NBC, and then there's a different sort of genre called trailer editing. Oh, okay. So I went from I was in I was at a trailer house. Then I went into television, cut these TV promos for NBC, and then I went back to trailer editing because that's where the real money was for editors. That was where the the biggest cash cow was, and so at the time, this was in the nineties. Some of the editors were making, I mean, a lot of money. They were for, I mean, I don't know what you guys consider a lot of money, but <laughs> somewhere in the six figure range, yeah. I guess. So is they're starting at yeah. six figures, yeah. and they were making anywhere. I think some of them were making around four hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. Wow, in the nineties. In the nineties, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe to Oprah and Bill Gates, it's not a lot of money, <laughs> but it's it's a lot of money. A lot, a lot of money right now for a lot, of, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I gotta go Again, back, sounds go good. back into yeah. that direction. <laughs> So I, I got a job at a company called The Ant Farm, and I started editing movie trailers there. And uh, it was a great, great experience. Um, one of my 
favorite mentors, Barbara Glazer, hired me there, and she taught me everything about story and about about um, making a moment out of something that's not really all that important. You know, because if you watch, if you watch a, if you watch movie trailers, you're really they're getting you to feel something, and a lot of times that 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 thing isn't even there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they do it with music. Yeah. They do it with sound effects. They do it with pauses. They do it with looks. They do it with all this different stuff. She really, she really taught me how to do that. And so while I was at Ant Farm, I edited some movie trailers. I was kind of doing a lot of romantic comedy stuff. I did things like Mona Lisa Smile with Julie Roberts. I did like a lot of the Jennifer Lopez Ben Affleck movies. <laughs> when Luckily, they, they're still together. Their, their yeah. first, their first, their first go around, yeah. like Jersey Girl, and I oh, even okay. worked on Gili, which was probably oh, yeah. considered one of the worst movies of all time. Probably up there. Yeah, <laughs> and I did it, edited movie trailers for uh, Soul Plane. That was Kevin Hart's first movie. Oh, um, Wimbledon. That was a tennis movie with Kirsten Dunst and Paul Bettany. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I did that. That trailer, these teenagers, these teenage girls, they give jeans to each other and they wear them all around the world. <laughs> um, there was even a part two. It was a book, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was America Ferrera. Okay, was, that was her first thing. Yeah, I was, I was like the romantic comedy guy. Mm -hmm. So that's that. That was my genre there. Yeah, but it was, a, it was a really great experience. So when you're in film, though, right? Some people will watch a trailer and they'll say, "Okay, I get it. I'm in. Like, I want to see it." Some trailers you watch, or at least I watch, and I feel like. They gave so much away. Do I need to see the movie? Because I kind of know where this is going. Yeah. Like what? What's when you're when you're kind of in that world of film? Mm -hmm. What What's the sort of idea that the, the what you put behind cutting a trailer mm -hmm. to not give away too much, but give enough to entice people to want to see this this film? Now, I hate, I hate to burst this bubble, but when people are editing movie trailers, yeah, movie tra <laughs> they don't care. Yeah, they don't care if. <laughs> if they gave away the whole movie. Okay. What is important is who are we reaching the audience? Is this movie going to make money? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times the movie trailers are being put together by the marketing department Understood. and not necessarily the filmmaker. A lot of times, you know, because if the, if the filmmaker's huge, like Tom Cruise or Christopher Nolan or somebody like then yes, they at times they'll come in. Or a director's cut or something yeah, of a film. Yeah, and... somebody who has so much so much pull in hollywood that they can control everything mm -hmm. but if you know if you're just a normal normal director and uh you don't have that much clout then the marketing department kind of does everything and their job is to make sure that movie makes money and if they show you the whole fucking movie mm -hmm. they don't care <laughs> yeah <laughs> because they need to make sure that that movie makes money otherwise they'll lose their job <laughs> yeah I know that didn't answer your question. No, no, but... no. It's good to know, though. I yeah. mean, for people, someone listening saying, like, oh, a film chair. You know, that's yeah. a lot of money, you know. Yeah. But the creativity may not be there depending on the level of the film and the, yeah. maybe the pressure behind the studio of, like, when this is releasing, how many tickets we need to sell. Yeah. How about the last one did? This is the sequel. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That's when the, that sort of, like, the corporate suits, so to speak, come in and yeah. influence how things are going to be yeah because a lot of people don't realize and i don't know if it's still the case now because things have changed since since then at the time if you made a if you made a 50 million dollar movie mm -hmm. you needed 50 million to market it sure yeah marketing budgets i don't think marketing people... budgets were huge yeah. that's why that's why trailers were making so much money <laughs> you know in trailer yeah. houses yeah. they were charging they were charging maybe like fifty thousand dollars for the first for the first trailer and then after that, they were charging per hour, mm. you know, for fixes. And some of these, I mean, some of some of the trailers, they would go to like version seventy five F, you know. And when I say F, they would go, okay, this is version seventy five, but here's A through F, different versions of music, you know. And so you would charge per version, you know. And the the money was just flowing. I mean, it check. was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy the amount of money some of the, the the owners were making. Now, when when you have these bigger films and these bigger directors and bigger actors, right? Is there any interaction that maybe an editor, someone editing the trailer, do they get involved? I guess maybe if they're producers on the film, or is mm -hmm. that you dealing more with the studio execs on that? Well, yeah, like I said, it's it's mostly the studio execs. Now, there were certain times. I think, um, what movie was I working on? Uh, Tenacious D. 
Oh yeah, Jack Tenacious Black. Tenacious D, The Pick of Destiny. Yep. Jack Black. Online cinema. Yeah. yeah. And he, Jack Black came in and, um, you know, he wanted to come in and look at the cut. Or um, I didn't work on uh, Mission Impossible, but uh, a buddy of mine did. And Tom Cruise came in and he would come in and he would have say. And then I think Vince Vaughn came in and one time for, I forget what movie it was for. And then Bruce Willis had come in. But again, these are, like I said, it's it's those guys that have, the cloud. The cloud. Yeah. These are, I mean, they're they're A listers, you yeah. know. So their name simply gets the movie made, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So they get to say, "Oh, I don't like the trailer," or you know. And it, it's it's really about how how hot you are at the time, whether mm -hmm. or not you, you get to go in those rooms. And most of them were producers, you know. So if they have if they have money in 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 the movie, or if they they helped to get the financing for the movie, then yeah, they they they, they usually come in. You know, it depends on, you know, and then there's, there's other people that just sort of just get their name on the title as producer and then they don't even, they don't, care, yeah. you know, yeah. they don't even do press. They're just like, <laughs> they're the manager of the writer. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. They're they just get, producer. you know, yeah. they just get the credit. So it's different every time. Mm -hmm. So then comparing that to like the TV spots and right. Is it, were you in that world where, where, where you're, you're just kind of doing like one portion of it and someone else is handling the sound design someone else is handling so, versus TV. Or like you're right. Doing everything. So I was doing everything as a predator at uh, at Studio City. And when I went to the ant farm, again, we went back to specialization. So we had a whole music department, music department. And I'd go, hey, I need I need 10 cues that are uh, sweet that will allow me to put dialogue over it that aren't too loud, you know. So I, they would, you know, and they'd upload these cues for me before I had to go find all that stuff myself, you know? Yeah. And then I need, and I need, and then I need, and I tell my assistant editor, I need, I need 50, 50 whooshes, you know, or I need <laughs> six booms, you know, or whatever, whatever it is. So I'd had an entire, you know, and there were so many specialized departments again, because there's more money. You got to invoice 75 G. Or yeah, you know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You got to, you got to, you got to pay for everybody. But yeah, it's it, again. There's more money in trailers than there are in TV mm -hmm. at the time. I know. I don't. Maybe it's. I don't know if that's still the same. TV's so good now. Mm -hmm. You know. So, so you're at there. How long do you stay at this place, the Ant Farm? I was at the Ant Farm for six years. Right around that time, uh, there was a. Uh, the, it was the housing crash. Oh, like oh eight. Yeah. Something. Around that time, there was a big housing crash, and um, budgets shrunk a lot. And at the time, they were paying per per cut. Like I said, you would you would you would do like a trailer for fifty thousand dollars, and then you would do revisions, and and you would get paid per revision. What ended up happening there at the time was somebody. I think it was Fox that started doing it, um, and they would say, "Here's three million dollars." which is a ton of money, but we want every TV spot. We want every radio spot. We want every poster. We want, we want, we want every trailer. We want, uh, you know, all these spots that they were paying for individually. You can imagine how much money that was. And now they're just saying, here, you got to do it all for this. Yeah. They did so it was, a, it was a complete restructuring of the industry. Uh, so people's salaries started getting cut. That's when I decided to move over into, uh, you know, I started to think, well, maybe, maybe the ship has sailed. Maybe this, that, that's it, which is weird because I always thought that the money would just keep coming. Mm -hmm. And you kind of do when you start making a lot of money. It's just, there's this sort of. Or you're just seeing what these movies are making at the box yeah, office. And yeah. Like, okay, like, why would anything change? It's going to get better. Yeah, it's right? going to get better. <laughs> Yeah, I ended up moving, leaving uh, the ant farm, and I went to work at a company called Trailer Park, which is actually still in Hollywood and still doing really well. And then I went to go work at uh, Universal Studios on the lot mm. in the trailer department over there. Now, what's that experience like? Because that has to be pretty cool being on so, the lot, right? I loved being on the lot. So Not I was Paramount a, with the Sears I was Tucker. Yeah. I was uh, I was at Paramount, um, you know, on the on the lot there um, as a page, but then I really wasn't in. Yeah. You know, I was I was a grunt. Now you're you know? like an established. Now I'm an established right? guy. I'm working at Universal, and I worked at Universal for two years, editing movie trailers there. I did movies. Uh, what did I work on over there? I did the movie for did the trailer for a movie called Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins. 
I remember that. I remember never. seeing that trailer. Yeah. I, I never saw the movie, but I remember the trailer. <laughs> I remember seeing the one sheet. <laughs> yeah, I ended up working there. It was great. Um, there was, uh, at the time, uh, Conan O'Brien had just- Oh, just started, signed that deal? Just signed that okay. deal. So I would see Conan in the gym. Oh, no kidding. All six foot five. Yeah, I have to away. say, yeah. So you, freaking tall yeah. with his giant red- The hair. Yeah. That, that red yeah. wave of hair <laughs> that he has. Uh, yeah, so I would see him at the gym, and it was it was just fun because the voice had just started. So there's a lot of no, there's excitement. a lot there's a lot of excitement on the lot. And I remember one time um, I'm going to get a sandwich, and uh, I see this small man, and he was driving this beautiful golf cart. It was like every other, all the other golf carts on the lot were just plain regular white golf carts, and this one was green, and it was like it was green, and it had like wood grain paneling. And it had like a, a grill on the front, and this small man with a hat on came, came out, and I said, "Oh, I said I love your golf cart," and he goes, "Oh, thanks." I I had to set a, set a few things to him, but nothing. I didn't know who he was, and my buddy comes over and he goes, "Dude, you're talking to Steven Spielberg." <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "What?" <laughs> so that was a real thrill. You know, you'd see people like that on the line. That that's the attraction of being on the line. It's fun to Absolutely. see to see celebrities and stuff. But yeah, that was cool. So then you stayed there for you said two years. I was there for two years, and then um, they had cutbacks. Oh, okay, so same thing. You know, yeah. you're facing with the housing crash in '08. Yeah, a couple years yeah. later. Yeah, so they had they had cutbacks, and uh, that the 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 year that I was there, Universal did not have a great year, uh, or the the second year I was there, it didn't have a great year. I think it was their three years to the end of the third year so they they resized and they got rid of they got rid of everybody yeah and um that's when i ended up uh, getting a call from a reality company and i was like i i, I don't know if i want to do reality it's kind of cheesy but i ended up taking and it wasn't it wasn't as much money i ended up uh, getting an, a, a call from a company called endemol shine north america and they, a guy named Michael Weinberg, said, "Hey, I got your number from a friend." And I, he said, "Do you want to, uh, do you want to audition for this job?" And I'm like, "What? What do you mean audition?" <laughs> I said, "Is this an on camera job?" And they're like, <laughs> "They're like, like no, we want you to audition to be an editor." Uh -huh. And I was like, "What? Yeah, I, I've been doing this for yeah. 15 years. Right. I'm not look what I drive." No. Yeah. <laughs> and and he goes, "No, we want people to audition." And I was like, "All right, whatever." So I needed a job. I ended up having to take a huge pay cut, a huge pay cut. And I auditioned against 45 other editors. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess like you said, the, yeah. the, the people were cutting, downsizing yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, it wasn't a great time for, for editors at that time. So I ended up getting the job. It was like 100,000 less yeah. than I was making. It was a big pay cut. But what they said was, we'll give you a three-year contract, which at the time yeah. was really hard. You couldn't get guaranteed work. But they said, we will get you back to your salary in the three years. So at the end of the three-year contract, you will be back to where you were. Mm. It's like, okay, let's give it a shot. Yeah. Um, so that was 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. That was 15 years ago, and I'm still there. Okay. Yeah. So then that's a different medium, right? Obviously, the, t the film to the television, but the reality component. So the reality component, it's still, it's still in the same neighborhood mm -hmm. because now what I'm doing is I'm writing, producing, and editing sizzle reels uh, to sell uh, reality shows to networks. So someone listening, when you say write, are you coming up with the script cop like the copy for what yeah. the voiceover is? Actually, I, or... I, I write I write some of the time now. Okay. A lot of the times um our uh, creative director We're in the fifteen years. Yeah. You know. So in the past when they would pitch television shows, they would go in with a deck. They call it a deck. And you would end up saying, Hey, here's the idea for the show and here's the PowerPoint and you'd watch this thing. But what this company did was they said, Hey, let's Let's show a trailer of what our our idea is, and so they hired. They wanted a trailer editor, so that's why they hired me. And now it's just industry standard. You go in with a tape now or a video, you know. You go in and say, "Hey, this is the idea for our show." Um, I didn't know it was groundbreaking at the time, but 
you know, now it's now it's a normal thing. But so I work in development now. And we at, at Endemol, we do a ton of reality. Our, our, our staples are Big Brother, which has been around forever. I don't know how many years. We've got uh, MasterChef and MasterChef Junior. We've got quite a few reality shows. And recently, you know, you know what's going on here in L.A. There's just been so much, so much striking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So with all the striking going on, there's like the there's no content. There's nobody shooting. But reality can continue to shoot because they don't really use actors. You know, they don't yeah. use actors and they don't use writers. So as a result of that, we've been pretty busy. We've been pretty busy. And I'm very, very, very grateful that, you know, at a time when a lot of my friends and who are in the in industry are, aren't working, that I get to, you know, provide for my family. Boy, that's huge. And what what would be like someone listening? What What's your sort of day to day like or not day, maybe a day to day changes, but like a, an overall week for you? Maybe mm -hmm. what does that sort what does that look like for someone saying, OK, you work to this company, they do a lot of reality based television. What's this week look like? So I, I usually get in in the morning. I check emails, make sure that everything's and there. Are no, there are no fires to put out. The beauty of my job now is that I they kind of let me do my own thing because I've been doing this for like 22 years mm. now. So they kind of let me do my own thing, and they'll say, "Hey, this is the idea." They'll show me the deck of what they're trying to pitch, the television show they're trying to pitch, and um, they'll I'll either write a script or they'll give me a script and uh, of the outline of the, the the main idea that they're trying to get across. And then I will usually find found footage. And that what that means is I'll pull from movies, I'll pull from television shows, and I will put together a reel based on that. My day-to-day -day is I walk in, I look at a blank timeline, I go, how the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> and then by the middle of the day, I'm like, okay, it's coming together. And then by the end of the day, I'm like, okay. I got a little bit of it done, you know, and then by the end of the week, usually in about a week, I have I have something I can present. And I'm like, and then, you know, and then after that, it's change city. I mean, people are just, you know, everybody has yeah. to put in their their two cents about collaboration. What, yeah, you know, the collaboration. Teamwork. Yeah. So I always I always just take pride in the first cut. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's like, you know, everyone adds knows. their. Yeah. Yeah. So then where do you see the, the sort of, you know, the future going in? this sort of editorial space you know it's really interesting because with ai it it's scary there's certain jobs that are going away yeah you mentioned that earlier yeah i, kinda, kinda I mean it's just that. so yeah. much ai uh, you know there there you can even i mean even for this podcast today yep. right yep they asked you if you wanted to do yeah there's if AI you wanted everywhere. separate files yeah. or if you wanted ai to cut it together mm -hmm, for you mm -hmm. so it's it's interesting i i don't I still don't foresee a time when AI can. I don't know. I, I but but right now I don't think AI can can predict a human emotion. Yeah. And 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 know when somebody's feeling something. You know, once we get there, we might be in trouble. Yeah. Never but, say never. <laughs> <laughs> for now, I think I think I'm I think I think we're okay in terms of the editors. Now, there's things like the colorists, people who color video. You can do that. You can by the touch of a button now. You know, it may not look as good as. The movies, you know, that you want to emulate, you can do sound now. You can say, hey, you can tag it and you can say, hey, this is a piece of dialogue. You always need to be able to hear this, 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 this person talking. And, you know, and you can do things like mixing the music. You can say, oh, when somebody's talking, the music needs to dip. You can just tell the AI to do that. There's all a lot of that. And I use Adobe Premiere, you know, and this, that, that software is always learning. So it's interesting, you know, maybe... You know, maybe I'm getting out at the right time. I'm 53 now, and you know, maybe in another 10 years I'll be done. But you know, it's it, it's kind of scary. It's we're we're, you know, it's like Terminator. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's it's it's, it's interesting how it's going to affect different industries, and, and and who really knows from time to time. But on on a, on a lighter note, you've also done like voiceover work in I this have, in yeah. the past, right? Yeah, have, like yeah. like in terms of you know editing, how does that how did that come about? Was it through trailer editing that you're like, "Wait a minute, I can just lay my own voice over here." Yeah. And then it became like, "Wait a minute, I can actually do this." Okay, well, when what I what I failed to mention, I was going to gloss over it, but I didn't I when I first moved out to LA, yeah. 
I thought I was going to be an actor. Okay. Yeah. We were just <laughs> just, just like everybody class else. Class president, right? Yeah. I thought I was going to be an actor. Or I was like or I, homecoming I, king, right? Yeah, I, I, I thought I was going to be an actor and I decided to try it, you know? So I got an agent and I got my headshots done and that's what I thought I would do. So I got an agent. I I went to my first audition. I booked it. I had a commercial. It ran for 13 years. It was called uh, the Computer Learning Center. Okay. And uh, I didn't get residuals, yeah. but so I at the time I told Catherine, my wife, I said, "It's easy." Yeah. What are they talking about? This 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 game's not hard. I never landed another thing oh, okay. after that. I went like two years with nothing. Yeah. It's like I can't do this. That's when I started editing. Okay. That's when I started. But what I did learn is how to talk on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was a terrible actor, but I did learn how to talk on camera. And when I ended up, uh, when I ended up learning how to edit at the time, it's not really the case anymore, but there's always voiceover. There was always voiceover in editing. So you go now, yeah, you know, the, you know, uh, Rolling Stone gives this movie five stars, you know, all, all that sort of copy. So you would read that as an editor, you would read that into your own microphone until the real guy came along, right? Understood. Yeah, so you would, so that's where I kind of learned how to do voiceover. I enjoyed it, and then I ended up starting, they would go, oh, well, let's just use him, you know? So I ended up starting to make a little bit of money in voiceover. I never made enough to make it my career, yeah. but I still do voiceover now for some of the reels that we do at Endemol Shine, and um, I have a regular client, a children's show called Cabillion. I don't have a big voice, but Cabillion, this 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 ra this kids kids network likes my voice for younger, you know, now on Cabillion, you know that sort of thing. Yeah. So I I say a lot of things like uh, like uh, Transformers X and My Little Pony and all that sort of stuff. So I learned to I I honed that skill by learn by by doing it so much as an editor. Yeah. And yeah. and and you're also doing YouTube. You have a YouTube channel. I do right? have a YouTube channel because you're a very like gear centric person. You know yeah. a lot about video, audio, obviously. Yeah. Cameras. Yeah. What's that about? Man, I I just I love this stuff. I love this is this is a DJI Pocket Three. <laughs> I love this new camera. It it has face tracking. Um, it's you know it's it's great. I I love all these little toys, and it's terrible because I'm <laughs> they're expensive. Yeah. But I thought, well, during the pandemic, there was uh, there's a there's a, a a vlogger named uh, Casey Neistat, mm -hmm. and Casey Neistat started this class. Hey, he's like, hey, I'm gonna teach you guys how to make YouTube videos. I was like, okay, let's. I'll jump in. I paid two hundred fifty dollars. I was like, I'm sitting at home. I might as well learn how to make YouTube videos. I already knew how to edit, you know, and I knew how to do voiceover. So I said, well, let's let's try it. So I ended up I ended up taking his class. It was funny because I he. He he ended up teaching us how how to make these YouTube videos, but um, I kind of like one of my my video at the end of the class was kind of like the most featured one. Okay, so I ended up putting the video up on YouTube, and it got, you know, I don't know twenty twenty thousand views or something like that, which is a lot for somebody like me, you know. And um, and I was like, oh, this is fun, you know. And so I decided to keep it going because what it allows me to do is it allows me to keep using, you know, it allows me to keep using all this gear. Yeah. And it allows me, gives me a reason to make, to, to use it. Yeah. You know, otherwise it's just sitting at home. Right. So the, you know, but I do love, it's funny because you, you do a job all day, right? And the last thing you want to do is do that same job when you go home. But to me, I do my job at work and it's creative, but it's not for me. Mm -hmm. It's for them. Yeah. It's for the show. It's for whatever. But this is just for me. And a lot of th a lot of times now, instead of paying for therapy, <laughs> I talk to people on YouTube. Yeah. I gotta go, guys, this is what I'm going through. <laughs> you know, my son just graduated from high school. He's getting ready to leave the nest. And me and Catherine, we don't know what to do with ourselves, you know. And it's therapeutic for me. Yeah. And I, I enjoy making these sort of creative little videos for myself mainly. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll ever turn into anything, but it's just it's it's uh it's funny. There was a there's a, a guy named um, Mark Duplass, you mm -hmm. know yeah. that is? Yeah. Duplass Writer, Brothers. Writer, yeah. yeah. And he always said, I always when I pick projects I do 
I do one for them and I do one for me. Mm. And so this is the one for me. Because he's like, I need something to pay the mortgage, but I also need something that has, he called them soul points. Yeah. And that's, it's creative for me. Yeah. You know? And just, I never knew that I was creative until I started editing, but now I realize I'm a creative person and I need an outlet. So uh, what's the name of the channel? It's called Joe's Talking. J-O apostrophe S Talking. J-O on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. Where else can people find you online? You can find me at Whiskey Joe 2. You guys can find me at Whiskey Joe 2 on Instagram and Joe's Talking. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll I put it in the show notes, you know, yeah. like clickable links and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, but I appreciate it, dude. This has been awesome learning, you know, so much about you. I know we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. But sitting down and just truly like understanding what you do for a living. Yeah. Sharing that with people who might be interested. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, know? you for, thank you for having me. And, and I, I truly think that the people that should watch this show or watch or listen to your, your podcast are the young folks. Yep. They're trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do with my life? You know, the world is changing so much with like we said with AI and there's all these different people that you feature on your podcast that you know they had to get there somehow yeah and if you can give anyone just a little insight on how to get there you know through all these different career paths um it's worth listening to yeah yeah all right man thank you again thanks joe thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of experience curve Please take the time to share this podcast with a friend or colleague to help get the word out about my show.